In the United States, on any given day, more than 1.6 million people find themselves incarcerated in state and federal correctional facilities. And when one counts persons in other custodial facilities, such as jails and juvenile institutions, the number approaches 2.4 million people. And there are approximately 4.2 million offenders on probation and more than 828,000 people on parole. So taken together, there are over 7.4 million Americans under some type of correctional supervision. This means that one in every 31 people living in the United States is under some form of correctional control. These figures indicate that the U.S. may be a country that is addicted to incarceration because it does not exercise the same type of restraint in locking up its citizens that we see in other Western industrial nations. Of course, it should be noted that American prisons have not always been overpopulated. In fact, during the early 1970s, there were less than 200,000 people residing in American prisons. The question then is why has there been a seven-fold increase in the prison population within the United States? While it is true that America's general population has jumped from 200 million people in the 1970s to just over 300 million people today, this increase in population explains only a fraction of the expansion of the incarcerated population. So why then has the United States supersized its prison infrastructure even during times when the crime rate has been stable and even substantially lower than subsequent periods? Well, the answer is that policymakers have made a deliberate choice to aggressively lock up offenders. It is interesting, though a bit sad to note, that the United States has only 5% of the world's population, yet it locks up 25% of the world's prisoners. This is an astounding statistic that is worthy of our attention. Throughout this course, we will be examining various theories of corrections. Each theory has an implicit or explicit blueprint of how the correctional system should be arranged. Interestingly, different theories tend to compete with one another because each one demands that the correctional system be organized in a different way. In politically liberal times, theories em em embracing uh, offender reformation have flourished, whereas in more conservative times, American corrections has been directed by theories advocating punishing offenders harshly through incarceration. As we examine the various correctional theories, keep in mind that social context matters. What people experience shapes how they see the world, which in turn makes them more receptive to certain correctional theories. Uh, another thing to consider is that many correctional policies and practices are based more on common sense rooted in individual experience than on hard empirical evidence. When policymakers fail to consult the evidence before intervening in the lives of others, this is unprofessional and ill-advised. Nevertheless, over the past few decades, the business of incarceration has been an enterprise where those in charge have done many things to those under their control without ever consulting the research evidence on what the best practices might be. Most social conservatives typically believe that retribution is achieved only when harsh punishments such as lengthy prison terms have been imposed. Retribution, which is also referred to by liberals as just desserts, seeks to be an end in and of itself. Therefore, this theory is considered to be non-utilitarian. Typically, scholars who favor retribution or just desserts believe that the punishment itself is the goal and that the punishment should be calibrated to the seriousness of the crime. The scholar who advocates for retribution believes that people break the law due to their own free will. There are also scholars who advocate correctional theories based upon the notion of deterrence. Deterrence theory proposes that offenders should be punished so that they will be taught that crime does not pay. 
Deterrence theory assumes that offenders are rational beings. Deterrence advocates oppose discretion. For example, they would not approve of giving judges the freedom to give one robber probation but to send another one to jail. Even if the robbers have offended for different reasons and have different circumstances and motivations, the advocate of deterrence would argue that both offenders should be punished exactly the same regardless of any mitigating circumstances. Deterrence theory posits that every time judges and parole boards exercise discretion, the cost of punishment is made either less certain or less severe. Deterrence theories are utilitarian in nature. Scholars who favor theories of incapacitation believe that nothing can truly be done to change criminals. Criminals are likened to wild, predatory animals who must be caged or locked up. When an effort is made to predict and incarcerate high-rate offenders, this is known as selective incapacitation. One thing to consider is that corrections is an expensive business, and there is an immense opportunity uh, uh, excuse me, an immense opportunity cost to prisons. An opportunity cost is what society forgoes when it spends money on one thing rather than another. For example, Texas is a state which has one of the highest rates of incarceration in the U.S. Because Texas incarcerates so many offenders, students in this state may pay higher tuition because than they otherwise would because tax dollars that could have been used to defray costs may have been siphoned off to pay for an ever-expanding prison empire. So think about that. Let's talk now about restorative justice correctional theories. Restorative justice theories are utilitarian because they seek to reduce harm. And if these theories were implemented into practice, they would be less costly for taxpayers since restorative justice seeks to take offenders out of the traditional justice system using prisons only as a sanction of last resort. Ideally, adherents of restorative justice seek to build a plan for restitution which does not rely heavily on judges, prosecutors, and defense attorneys. Of course, in a nation that has more than 2.4 million offenders incarcerated, it may be difficult, if not impossible, for this correctional philosophy to truly come to fruition. Also, critics of this philosophy argue that restorative justice is not rooted in sound scientific evidence-based corrections. Advocates of rehabilitation often believe that individuals commit crimes because of various risk factors identified by criminologists. Early intervention strategies which involve placing at-risk risk children into programs at an early age would typically be embraced by those who favor rehabilitation theories of corrections. Early intervention strategies are unique in that they tend to focus on what should be done with individuals before they break the law. As you read about and reflect upon all of the various correctional theories, consider the fact that officials often make decisions about imprisonment based upon myths, traditions, politics, and personal experience. It is preferable to base decisions using standard social science techniques, also known as the scientific method. This has been part of the movement to have evidence-based corrections. In corrections, policymakers have historically done a poor job of using research to help make the best decisions possible. Because corrections is a very serious business that affects the lives of countless individuals, only the very best evidence available should be employed to inform correctional policy and practice. When we look at the history of correctional philosophies and practices in the United States, it is important to note that rehabilitation emerged as the dominant philosophy beginning in the early part of the 1900s. However, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, rehabilitation was attacked by both conservatives and liberals. In 1974, Robert Martinson, in a famous essay, argued that nothing works in correctional treatment. 
In this piece, he reviewed 231 studies evaluating the effectiveness of correctional treatment programs between 1945 and 1967. He argued that by and large, these programs had no effect on recidivism. Martinson's uh, Nothing Works thesis was accorded spectacular credibility. Even though the rehabilitative idea had been a dominant correctional theory for over 150 years, policymakers were willing to abandon this ideal after the publication of Martinson's study. Martinson's study told policymakers something that they desperately wanted to hear. For those already doubting correctional treatment, this article provided proof that nothing works. And, while it should be noted that subsequent studies suggested that many rehabilitative programs do in fact work, this evidence was virtually ignored. Consider a 1986 article written by Professor James Marquardt that was published in the journal Justice Quarterly. The article, titled Doing Research in Prison, is an ethnographic, complete, observational study where the author worked as a correctional officer for a year and a half within the Texas prison system. Mark Hort collected his data between June of 1981 through January of 1983. Keep in mind that this was several years after the infamous Martinson study had been published. Mark Hort's study clearly illustrates that the rehabilitative idea at least in Texas, had been abandoned, if it ever truly even existed to begin with. If you closely read the article, you will notice that Mark Hort focuses on the manner by which inmates were controlled. During the 1980s in Texas, it was not uncommon for guards to use sheer force to control unruly inmates. Mark Hort admits to doing this in the article, and even argues that using force helped him gain credibility with other inmates and his fellow officers in the prison environment. Marquardt's study is unique in that it is one of the only studies in the prison literature where a researcher has been a full participant in the environment he is studying. As you read Marquardt's study, ask yourself whether or not these findings are valid. In your opinion, does this article provide an example of insider or outsider knowledge? Do studies such as these give policymakers any type of meaningful information that can be used to make important decisions in corrections, or are quantitative research studies preferable? As you read through Mark Hort's article, as well as the other material assigned for this session, consider which correctional philosophy makes the most sense to you. Do you believe in things such as indeterminate sentencing? Should judges and prosecutors enjoy discretion? Or do you favor legislation such as truth in sentencing and three strikes laws? Most of all, ask yourself this question. Can the U.S. sustain its current incarceration rate at the pace it is going? Keep in mind that incarceration is a very expensive business. Every person who gets locked up takes valuable tax resources that could be spent in other areas such as health care, education, or social welfare. Also, the founders of the penitentiary sought to morally reform offenders and truly believed they were capable of rehabilitating the wayward. If they were alive today, what do you suppose these reformers would have to say about prisons and punishments in the 21st century America.